Back to My Garden, episode 89. Welcome to Back to My Garden. Discover your passion for gardening. Here's Dave Ledoux. Attention garden lovers. Do you want to save time, save money, and have your most amazing garden ever? Receive free tips, strategies, and gardening techniques from passionate gardeners around the world. Join the VIP club for free today at www.backtomygarden.com front slash VIP. It's finally here. 99 remarkably clever gardening ideas that you can use immediately. It's a free report. You get instant access. It's an epic list of tips, hacks, and gardening shortcuts just for you. Go to www.backtomygarden.com front slash clever. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world when you listen to this. I'm Dave Ledoux, and welcome to another edition of Back to My Garden. And I'm excited about this one, folks. We're going down to Los Angeles, California. Shelley is a talented garden designer and feng shui advisor. Her company, Harmony Gardens, helps clients to create beautiful spaces and a lucky life. Shelley is the author of Secrets of the Land, Designing Harmonious Gardens with Feng Shui. She teaches, is a landscape architect, a lecturer, and a consultant, and she blogs at HarmonyGardens.net. I'm going to learn a lot today. I can feel it. We have a lot to talk about. Please welcome Miss Shelley Sparks. Hi, Shelley. Hi. So well, nice to be with you. I'm excited that you're here. Uh, for many personal reasons, other than just making a great podcast, because my wife is into feng shui, and now I get to figure out what it all means. Oh, cool. Oh, that's great. I can't, uh, I can't wait to, to talk about that. <laughs> I gave you a little brief introduction, and I want to get to know you better, and our listeners want to hear your stories. Uh, Shelley, take a minute or two, relax. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, and how did you get into gardening? Well, you know, I, uh, I think um, I, I started gardening when my, my children were small many, 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 many years be, uh, ago, before I was even a landscape architect. And um, when, uh, I, and I liked, you know, growing things to, to eat at home and things like that, and I made all the funny mistakes that most people make. Um, you know, I, I really was hesitant to get into gardening at first because I always seemed to kill my house plants. <laughs> So I used to think that I had a brown thumb. And um, what I've learned over the years is that um, really what that, what that equated to was the fact that I didn't, um, I didn't take care of my plants. Um, <laughs> I didn't nurture them. I didn't work with them. Uh, and I didn't relate to them. And that's really why things uh, perish so quickly in my, in my presence. But over the over years, I've I've worked in the garden, and I've really found that it is a healing space, and that's why um, I made it my mission in life to uh, to work with people and try to engage them in their garden. So when I'm designing a landscape, I'm not just designing um, out in a tower that's absent of everything uh, related to the client. I'm really trying to engage my client to find the plants that they love um, so that they're going to get involved with their garden because that's the only way that the healing effects of the garden can take place. Fantastic. Uh, Dear listener, there's going to be a lot of resources and good stuff mentioned. I'm taking notes for you. Uh, Come over to the blog at backtomygarden.com. Make sure you follow Shelley on social media. She has a great Twitter feed at Shelley's Garden, and that's S-H-E-L-L-E-Y-S-G-A-R-D-E-N. And check out Shelley's website at www.harmonygardens.net. Uh, your book, is it on Amazon or through your website? It, it's both on Amazon and through my website. Uh, you can search by title or by author, yes. Shelley Sparks, and I'll have a link up for sure from Amazon. Um, where to start? Let me tell you, I'm instantly uh, on thin ice because you use words like healing space, very kinesthetic words. 
Yeah. And I've had garden designers on who talk texture, vertical, uh-huh. contrast, all visual words. And I seem to be like this lump of coal. I don't get any of it. I don't have that magic power. Um, I tried. I, I said the word. Um, I can't even. How did I describe it? Um, you have the ability to sort of see a space as it could be, rather than the way it is. Yes, exactly. Is that a talent that can be developed? Yes, you know it. It really can because. When I started in landscape architecture, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a uh, kind of an odd story. Uh, but I, uh, when uh, oh, more than 30 years ago, I decided to change my career. And um, I was doing social work. So something as far away from what I'm doing as possible almost. And um, I... I just started taking classes in different areas, and uh, I took a class in landscape architecture. And this was when I couldn't draw a stick figure, I had never done any design, and I didn't know the names of any plants. Uh, The only thing I had done is grown zucchini in my garden, zucchini and tomatoes, (laughs) which gardeners know are the easiest things in the world. (laughs) So... um, And somewhere in my first class, I had a prophetic dream that uh, that really I believed in and and led me to to pursue landscape architecture. So all of the designing skills, all of the plant names, all of the seeing spaces are skills that you can acquire. Wow. Wow. Wow, I just got some encouragement because Latin, oh my goodness, it's so hard sometimes. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I do these wonderful podcasts with wonderful plantsmen and they just remember every piece of Latin and I'm taking notes and I'm messing. <laughs> when you try to Google something that you've spelled wrong, it's not very good. Oh no, it doesn't go well for you. <laughs> so you had a real uh, leap of faith to get into I, something like that. I did. I did. I had a leap of faith. And I've, I've had, you know, I've had a few of those over the course of my lifetime. And, of course, feng shui actually ended up being the same sort of thing. I just kind of, I, I must say that I kind of fell into it. Um, I, uh, at the time that I started studying, uh, more than 20 years ago, um, my, uh, I took a class because I read something about um, increasing balance and harmony. And I felt that that's what I do in my gardens when I design gardens. So I I thought, well, maybe I can learn something from this. And I just, I got hooked. And I ended up uh, studying with a one of the foremost uh, feng shui masters in the world. Um, becoming a senior disciple of his and um, and practicing and then writing this book uh, under his guidance. So I, um, you know, just just seem to that it seems to me that when you're on a path that is correct and right, you, the door is just open for you. Yeah, you hear people use the word "quote unquote." It feels right. Yeah, And, you know, it's like the human body can tell. And, you know, I have a smattering of physics. That's what I went to university for before med school. And so I understand, you know, this table I'm leaning on is not really a table. You yeah. know, it's a bunch of swirling atoms and, and electron <laughs> energy. Uh, but that doesn't explain why there's, like, models of fish around my house or coins hanging on strings. Well, let, let, me, let me just say something about... about what you just said, because you, what, you know, what you just said is something that I teach all the time. And that, and, and, you know, people wonder about what, why, you know, you said that you wonder why I said healing in, as it relates to plants or the garden. And that, the, your physics example is the perfect example for that, because those molecules, they're, they're swirling around your desk, but, you know, you're sitting right next to them. So the way that your desk, uh, those molecules are going to be interchanging with your molecules. And the same thing happens with plants. The same 
same thing happens with, you know, the various things that are placed uh, for particular purpose, uh, for particular purposes with feng shui, uh, adjusting the feng shui in mind. I just had that feeling like there's no way we're going to cram anything into a 30-minute <laughs> podcast because um, somebody goes, well, I don't know anything about feng shui. And I go, well, go go rent a movie called What the Bleep Do We Know? If you want like a an accessible movie to get you into the background of uh, f- physics and particle right. theory and right. feng shui. and Yeah, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of the way it is. It, it, you know, feng shui is, is energy. It's about that, uh, that force. And, you know, everybody feels and has that sense. I mean, I, I know this is hap- must have happened to you when you walk into a garden that's really beautiful, but it doesn't, for somehow the, it, the space doesn't feel right. And, uh, and then you'll walk into a garden that's kind of like, looks like it's a little messy and overgrown or something like that but it, it just feels like home and and houses often feel that way to people as well and that's and basically what you're feeling is the feng shui of the space let's give the listeners a bite-sized piece that they can relate to um, we have a lot of people who live in cities and have patio gardens very small spaces is it easier to design a small space or a big space you know, it, honestly, it it doesn't make much much difference. It's really all about, you know, all about the the what you what you want to have around you. Because I've lived in you know places that have really huge spaces, and um, and I've lived in places where I just had a balcony. And no matter where it was, I've you know I've worked really hard to create you know my vision of Eden there. And that's really what I I want all of your listeners to understand that their vision of Eden is their unique vision and then there's nothing wrong with that there's it's all good with that um, and what you should the biggest thing that I uh, I think I achieve with most of my clients is that you want to have things around you that you love so um, you <clears throat> you want to have uh, plants I mean, when I'm, when I'm showing clients pictures of plants, because I insist that all of my clients take an active involvement in the design of their garden. Um, and when I'm showing pictures of plants uh, to my clients, you know, proposing this plant or that plant, um, unless they really look at it and say, I love it, or, you know, uh, then, then it's not something that we include. Um, if they look at a plant and they say, wow, I love it, then they, that's a plant they should have. And, and I, I really want to encourage everybody that's listening to this to really look at everything that's in your environment. I mean, inside or outside doesn't really matter in terms of feng shui, but inside or outside, you really need to have things that support you. And the things that you love are going to support you. It must be uniquely challenging in your career because you live in Los Angeles, so you have clients that are often inheriting a space from a previous owner. Uh-huh. And then plus you're in one of the most uh, water-challenged, rained, drought-stricken areas of the country. Right. What's that like for you? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's been, uh, it's, it's been, in some ways it's been challenging but in other ways, it's been really exciting because um, you, you get to, I get to learn about new plants. I, in the last uh, probably three years, I have learned so many new plants. And there's, uh, in Los Angeles, you know, we live in paradise here in a lot of ways because everything grows here. So um, we've got such a variety and options of variety, it's really almost uh, anything that the uh, nurseries will grow, we can use. So it's just amazing the new plants that have come into our, uh, uh, our ability to use here in Los Angeles. And I'll tell you, I'm having a field day using them. 
I just had an aha moment while you were talking. It's almost too much. It's narrowing the focus, not choosing <laughs> more, right? It's a filtering process. Yeah. It is. It is. So usually um, we were talking briefly before we went on air about uh, drought tolerant. And usually I um, there's a lot of gardens here. You know, here in Los Angeles, the uh, Department of Water and Power actually pays people to um, get rid of their lawns and... Uh, replace them with drought tolerant planting, and a lot of times people think that drought tolerant planting just is cactus. And there's so much uh, variety that we can offer a person that I have to really start by limiting what, which general direction we're going to go in. So um, I'll talk to them about well, do we want to use natives or do we want to? Um, do you want to use Mediterranean type plants or do you want to use um, succulents or cactus? And sometimes you can, you can uh, do some combinations of those different types of general types of plants. And I do, but you have to kind of uh, be careful with it because of their different watering needs. Oh, that's true. Just because it can handle the... <laughs> You know, something that grows in the Caribbean may handle the heat, but it may come from a more uh, rainfall than you're used to in California. Exactly, uh, exactly. And we we irrigate everything here in California. So, you know, right now we're doing a lot of drip irrigation. My wife has taken a few classes on feng shui, and when we moved into our new house, she went around saying, oh, we need a fish here and coins on a cord here and... You know, being a guy, I had tons to do that month, so I didn't pay a lot of attention. But it's fascinating because there are techniques to kind of help with the energy in your house. And then she's starting now to do stuff out in our in our garden. Um, I find it a little daunting and overwhelming. Did you find that in the beginning? Uh, no, actually, I didn't. I actually found that feng shui made it easier to arrange the garden because it gives you some parameters to start with. And, uh, and you know, really, honestly, what you're doing is responding to the land again. You know, when, I, when, when I'm doing designs, there's three factors that I take into account. My client, the architecture, and the land. And so those are the three things that, uh, you know, most people... Again, you have, when you were saying, oh, you know, you've got this blank canvas, it's, you know, it, it can be overwhelming when you're a gardener to just kind of start to figure out how you're going to organize spaces and what are you going to do. But um, what I like to do is I like to start with concepts. So when, you, when you're, uh, I'm doing a garden right now that is on, on an area that is, right near a very open open area, native, wild area. And so we're continuing that, so kind of borrowing this, the open spaces into this garden and doing a lot of natives and some Mediterranean plants. And, um, and so, you know, you really have to read each space and house. If the architecture of this particular house was different, I would have gone in a different direction. Um, if the client was, you know, didn't didn't like uh, outdoor spaces, didn't like woodsy kind of things, didn't like uh, natural looking things, I would have gone in a different direction. So all three aspects have to be accounted for. And when you're doing that, when you're listening to your land and you're you're looking at your design, you really you you really can't go too wrong with feng, with the feng shui of the land. Shelly, you're a writer, you're a teacher, a lecturer, you're working all the time with clients, you live in one of the busiest cities on earth. Do you have any time to garden yourself? <laughs> I, I do, but not much. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, one of the, uh, I'm one of my clients that says, get me low maintenance. <laughs> yeah. But uh, on the other side of that, I'm also, you know, I'm also wanting to try different plants to make sure that they are, they'll be successful in my client's garden. So, 
And I'm also one of those terrible clients that falls in love with every other plant and wants to have one. <laughs> ah, I love it. <laughs> You'd get along well with my wife. She's almost incapable of visiting a garden center and leaving with empty hands. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, sometimes I, I've had people say, oh, I should come over and look at your garden. And, and most people that come to my garden are just, you know, they really love it. But, of course, you probably know the same thing. I, uh, you know, I see the flaws. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me to show my garden off because I can, you know, I can see, oh, well, that, you know, I should have had those plants and maybe I'll show it to them in another year when that plant is fully grown in or, you know, at, you know it's, 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 it's easier for me to criticize my own work, my own garden. Yeah. Let's take a minute to thank our sponsors and then come back and play five quick questions. What's the hottest trend in gardening? I think the hottest trend is aquaponics. Can you really grow a massive garden powered by fish? Find out more and discover the secrets to building fish-powered gardens at www.backtomygarden.com front slash fish. Are you concerned about toxic chemicals, GMOs, and frankenfood? Don't panic. Grow organic. Discover my new resource for organic gardeners. Go to www.backtomygarden.com front slash myorganic. I was just glancing at the clock and our time is whipping by. Now's yeah. the time in the show where we play a game called Five Quick Questions. Okay. This is your chance to share wisdom and experience with novice rookie gardeners. Are you ready to play? Yes. And I've changed the questions up for 2015, so I'll keep you on your toes. Okay. Question one. What is... This is the category of bloopers. What's the funniest mistake that you've made in a garden that you're willing to admit to publicly? Um, I, I don't know about funniest mistake, but I think uh, one, of the, one of the more common mistakes that I, I, I've made is oversizing pots, mm -hmm. making, uh, making them, you know, seeing a space, thinking, oh, that needs a huge pot, and then ordering the pot and the pot coming in and uh, thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> where does this go? <laughs> wow. So, yeah, having to, uh, having to uh, arrange, you know, arrange everything. I mean, you can always arrange, rearrange things, uh, but that's, that's probably the most common thing that, that's happened to me. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I thought you were going to say the exact opposite. <laughs> really? I, I tend to jam way too much stuff into teeny tiny pots. Oh, yeah. Well, I, 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 uh, I have a tendency, a little bit of a tendency to overorder on, on plants, too. But, it, you know, again, you have to gauge your client and the amount of, uh, oh, I, yeah, and, and amount of space that they, that they want or have, too. Yeah challenging thing with the bigger pots yeah it reaches is. a point where a human has a tough time moving them yeah yeah that's what dollies are for <laughs> <laughs> you know you're in a new level when you have a dolly for your pots in your garden that's right yes a uh, question two what's some a skill that you have in the garden that you're really proud of or something unique that you have a, a skill in um, I, I would say, uh, the one skill that I, I, I'm really, uh, grateful to have is, is, um, you know, just communicating with my plants. Mm. And I think that I know that that's a skill that everybody can, um, can acquire once you, you know, once you, uh, once you just start really relating to them as other sentient beings. Um, a lot of, a lot of times, um, you know, if I'm going on a trip, I'm going to be gone for two weeks. I always go around my garden and talk to my plants, tell them to hang on. I'll be back. <laughs> uh, you know, if they're not going to get the particular care that they're used to, or, you know, maybe they might not get as wa watered as often as I do. Um, and that they just, you know, they just, you know, have to, have to hang on to their energy. 
I've forgotten the name of the Japanese scientist. There's a clip in the movie, What the Bloop Do We Know, yes. where they shout at water molecules yes. and put it under the electron microscope. And the energy you put into the water gets, it changes the properties of the water molecule. Yeah. And I'm going, yeah. 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 It's physics. You think on a level, I mean, it's beyond the scope of this conversation, just mm-hmm. how... So many people are so stressed out and they're eating animal byproducts that are so stressed out and they live their life 19 hours a day so stressed out. Um, I think you said it in the opening line. It's uh, designing a healing space. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's what I think anything, anybody that, again, that's why I really try to get my clients to love you know, to find plants that they love in their garden. Because I know once they have a plant that they love, they're going to start tending to it. And once they start tending to it, they're going to have the healing by, by um, effects of, of relating to that plant. Oh, I just had another aha. So then it goes from being Shelley's garden where they paid money for it to this is my space. They take it's, ownership. Ah. Absolutely. I, that's what, you know, that's my demands. <laughs> Not demands, but that's what I really like to, to do with my, uh, with my residential clients. Then they get involved in the watering and the pruning and the maintenance, and it becomes the therapy of right. tending the space. Ah. Absolutely. I'm just nodding along like no one can see me <laughs> nodding, and I'm waving my hands in the air. I had this giant hot pepper plant last year that kind of became my buddy, and I'd move him around the garden. And, you know, I'm at that stage where I still have emotional attachments to plants that I purchase or that I grow. I understand. Well, I, oh, I would hope that everyone does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, big, broad scope of conversation here, but question three is about websites. Now, I want all the listeners to... Check out Shelley's uh, website and resources at HarmonyGardens.net. Uh, do you have any favorite gardening resource sites or landscape design sites that you could suggest? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I love, for plants, um, I, I always, there's a couple of them that I, there are my go-to places. One of them's really located here in Southern California, so I don't know that I'd recommend that because, um, because, <clears throat> because it's just located here and that's local. But Monrovia, I know Monrovia.com has really good uh, recommendations uh, for plants, and I know they're distributed at least throughout the United States and probably in Canada as well. Um, and another uh, site that I really like, it, like is Dave's Garden, mm-hmm. davesgarden.com, because... He has a lot of really great information and a lot of unusual plants as well. So um, uh, I use that. I use that as well as a resource. Love it. Good. 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 <laughs> now, if question four is the flip side: is a book. Uh, do you have a particular favorite gardening book that you uh, yeah, love my, and refer to? Yeah, my go-to gardening book is Sunset Western Garden mm-hmm. Book. Yeah. It's uh, and they have a national uh, 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 book also as w- as well. So it covers all the different zones. And one of the reasons I really like Sunset Western Garden Book is because they break it into subzones. You know, you have uh, there's so many different climatic differences. Uh, even for instance, here in Los between here in Los Angeles and San Diego, and even parts of Los Angeles are. Um, in different microzones, and and so that really helps me to uh, uh, pinpoint the exact climate zone that a that a plant will thrive in. And so um, I don't know that that's uh, that's I know that's not going to be available to people around the world, but uh, but I would encourage them to find the books in their areas that really can help them determine what microclimate uh, the plants are going to thrive in. Microclimates are fascinating because it can be raining in one part of L.A. and not raining in another, and Absolutely. even a yard could have a microclimate. Yeah, exactly. Even yards can have microclimates. But 
it's it can be extremely dramatic here in Los Angeles because we have seaside, uh, you know, people that are next to the beach, and then uh, I just designed a garden for a place that is you know uh, is right on the beach, and and on con- contrasting that out here in the San Fernando Valley where I live, it's hot. <laughs> It's really hot, and it, it, we don't have we don't have as much of that ocean influence. So it's it's there's the climate is really very different. Living in a four season climate, the the part of the garden that's sunny in May is less mm-hmm. sunny in September, when you need the sun the most. So you have to plan, considering the entire season as well. Yes, yes. I I lived in Toronto and. I loved the four seasons when I lived there, but as an adult, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I understand. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> when you're glad. Ball game. There's this new phenomenon of this zone pushing and, and four season gardening where people have said, have said I'm going to try. And I built. I tried to build a cold frame, but it blew away in the fall. So <laughs> I have to do some more anchoring next year. Yeah, yeah, it's it it's really it is it does you can push the envelopes, especially if you take really good care of the plant and give it exactly what it wants. Uh, but it takes another level of of uh, of concern and involvement to do that. Question number five is a fun one, Shelley. Picture your brand new novice rookie gardener. It's their very first season. And they come to you and they say, can you give me a one big tip on using feng shui in my garden? Oh. Uh, one I, big, this is the big tip. The big tip. Um, I can give you a great tip. Go to your entry. Uh, the, the most, probably the most important place of your entire property is the entry to your home. And... Think about what you would do if the king of your of your uh, country, the prime minister, the president, uh, if you like them, <laughs> would visit your home. What would you do to doll it up and make it absolutely fabulous? Because you are ac- the the most important uh, visitor that is ever going to come to your home. So. Do that for yourself. Wow. So for those of you who enter into your house through the garage, you might want to move the piles of (laughs) the garage junk. Yeah. You know, when I'm doing feng shui for my club, yeah, but you always want to go to the architectural front door. That's a good, that's Mm -hmm. a good point. Because if you enter through the garage, uh, that's one thing, but the architectural front door is where the feng shui, where all energy enters your home. And so that's the point that I'm really referring to. I love it. Clearing away the piles of uselessness and yeah, releasing that out into somebody else to use. Right. And also if, if there's plants that are blocking your doorway, that should not be. You know, if you're... If you're um, I've had an experience where I've walked down streets that of you know people I don't know and you know in a neighborhood with a friend and I've pointed to houses and say I bet a person like such and such lives there because you know uh, um, one of my yeah one of my friends uh, pointed a, such a house out to me and I said I bet an I agrifolia ag <laughs> a person that's afraid to leave <laughs> their home lives there. And she said, how did you know that? And it was just clear. They were just blocked in. Their whole front was just all closed down. They, you couldn't even see where to get in. Um, so people, your, your front entry and the way, uh, the front entry to your home and the way that you see your front, um, the front of your home talks a lot about who you are and what face you're putting out into the world. And uh, whether that's inviting, whether it uh, tells people to go away, um, or whether you're going to, um, you know, it's, it's highly protective. There's, there's many different ways that we express ourselves uh, to the world and 
and whether we invite those uh, the world's energy into our you know into our spaces and that that's really what your entry is all about your entry and front face of your home wow 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 dear listener i told you this was going to be a good episode make sure you follow shelly on twitter at shelly's garden uh, visit her on the web at www.harmonygardens.net and pick up a copy of her book on Amazon, Secrets of the Land, Designing Harmonious Gardens with Feng Shui. Think of this podcast as a starting point, and uh, Shelley can definitely direct you to transforming your space. Uh, Shelley, you've been a tremendous guest. Oh, thank you for asking all these wonderful questions. I love to... Um I would love to pass on information that are, that's going to uh, help people in their lives. I want to invite you to have the last word to the listeners around the world today. Can you leave us with either a pearl of wisdom or a note of encouragement? Okay. Yes. Um, don't be afraid of plants. You know, in your garden, if you uh, invite a plant, I, 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 I told you that I thought I had a brown thumb. Well, occasionally I do. I, uh, when I fall in love with a plant, I invite it into my yard, but sometimes it dies. And then I'll try it again. But after that, it's like it had its chance, live or die. So <laughs> don't be afraid of, um, of, of trying different things and seeing if they work for you. Uh, make sure that you surround yourself with things that you love and uh, make your, your home and your garden a place of peace, harmony, and beauty. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you for being on the show, Shelley. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Dave.